Thank you so much and thank you all. I know it's a bright and early morning after a lot of uh, celebrations that happened last night. And thank you to our esteemed panelists uh, who are with us today. And I want to just kick off by saying that uh, co-productions, you know, great word, very uh, misunderstood and sometimes just not understood at all. So I am really happy to have this panel, uh, which comprises of uh, writer, directors, uh, producers from Germany, from Indonesia, and sales and distribution expertise, so that we can cover the entire gamut right from the idea of why co-production might be right for your film to actually making it and then getting it out. Um, I want to start off with you, Pan, uh, since this is the start of the project. This is where the idea is born. This is where the person who has, uh, you know, the hope for a co-production on a project. Uh, what does it take for someone like you to have cracked this, if I may say so? Um. I think for me, uh, whatever I know, not from myself, from the co-producer who decide to work with me or sales company who come on board, is partly based on my past work and what I'm selling it to them. So to, to take the example of the last movie, last film show. Uh, so right here in Cannes, we came here, we had meeting with a lot of sales company but most were not willing to give us any MG, <laughs> minimum guarantee. So, and we had decided, I had decided since 10 to 15 years that I will not apply for any fund. I had enough of funds. Uh, they take forever. <laughs> and with the same energy, I know I can raise fund, you know, in going to two to three market. And we did that in last three movies. So we did the same thing. And finally, we had a meeting with Orange Studio, who are a sales company, and they read the script. They said, we want to know more. Can you show us casting and locations? So we went back to India. We sent them more stuff, casting, location. Can you tell us more about, we know your past work, but can we see who is going to be the technical team? So we sent showreel of cinematographer, music composer, and said, OK, then can you do post in Paris? I said, if you come on board, yes. <laughs> so they did come on board. And that's how you know we were able to do all this. Uh, we met in Cannes in month of May. And we were shooting in September. Wow. So that that's, was... <laughs> that's probably the fastest. Yeah. So, and, and, and purely because everyone was equity investor. There was no soft money involved. And I realized, for me, that's going to be the way forward because we did that in previous film. Uh, for Indian subject to raise soft money now has become extremely hard. And even if you wait such a long time, it takes long time to get 100,000 euro, let's say in Cinema du Monde in France, or, uh, and you keep applying and, you know. So I would rather put that energy going around, uh, you know, and really trying to sell the project with my producing partner. So this is one way, and this is probably the newest way. And have you done something like this on your previous films or were you still going for the... No, films? I did the same. This is my third attempt. Okay. So, and it worked because those people got their money back. So, <laughs> so the first one was with Angry Indian Goddesses. We had German co-production. Uh, in a similar way, the casting, we said, we are putting the money. We just need 250,000 euro. And uh, so they calculated risk and they spoke to sales company. Uh, which was Mongrel Media from Canada. And they gave us a figure, so like, look, you can risk. They wanted the first position in recruitment, so which we gave them, like the Orange Studio. That's the one thing you have to give it in, <laughs> because you can't have it every way. Uh, but, you know, everyone recouped money, film made money, and then we sold it to Netflix Worldwide Rights. Uh, so the second documentary was easier even, uh, which was just 100,000 euro, which was from France. Uh, Cite film, Rafael Bertigo, maybe you know, so he said, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, he said, can you show me 20 minutes of footage? And then I decide. Uh, and so two things happened. We shared the footage with him and the film got invited to Toronto for TIFF Docs. Uh, and he put in the money and we, so, so I, I have realized if you have no time to mount the, <laughs> the co-production are very long, yeah. otherwise, I mean, to raise uh, fund with, soft money and what happens in India I think the main problem is our investors bring in cash and most of the time if you work with Europe or New Zealand or other countries they are going to depend on soft money so you spend forever trying to figure out that contract absolutely and thank you 
here's uh, two amazing people who have spent collectively maybe over you know half a century in doing this. You've got 30 years of experience, and you've got you know probably the same, even though you don't look it. No, no, no. I'm sure you started very young at the age of 10 because you don't look at Dave. Um, but yeah, so so hearing how Pan went about it, uh, and you worked on Indian co-productions and with German money, I'd love to hear your thoughts on you know what you feel about co-productions, where they've come, where they started, and where they're going. So hello, welcome everybody. It's always a pleasure to deal with India, in Indian colleagues. What can I say? I mean, I'm really from the other side of the world, like him, and I envy you. But of course, there is market, there's market finance projects, Americans do it, Indian Americans do it, big, big uh, directors might, might do it, but our reality is normal filmmakers. And what I can say today and what I really like and what I'm really excited about is that India is at a moment where it's really moving. And I can feel it. There is more and more Indian films going out to the festivals. It reminds me a bit of the French when they started with Uni France 20 years ago or something, or longer. But I mean, really to invest effort and to build awareness of the French films around the globe. Actually, what the Germans are not so super good at, but the French really did it very well. And with India, I feel it's a bit the same. I must say, I've been coming here to this kind of panel since some years also. 50 years not, but okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm enjoying it, but okay. I can really see and feel that India is, uh, is moving. And there is one, if I may say, there is this film bazaar in Goa, which is a fantastic tool. I've been there also almost for 10 years there since the beginning, and I can really see, my God, you are really moving. So what is it what I can do as a co-producer, because we are here talking about co-production. And let's say, for me, it's not about money. It's absolutely about people that like to work together. And then the story follows, if it follows. So you have to get to know one another. And this is also for me was a journey. I never thought about becoming someone working in India or in Bangladesh now also. Uh, but I went there and I discovered people that I liked and I connected to. And that started it. And I think this is going to grow. And I mean, you are also working with that area of the world. I mean, it is growing and we, we're getting to know each other and the markets and the requirements but that follows. You know? So this is a fantastic time. And what, what is the essence of what I might say is, um, okay, you meet people, you like them, there is an interesting project, and then maybe you have an idea and knowledge of the international market that your Indian colleague doesn't have, or the filmmaker. And that's where it really gets, let's say, inspiring for both sides. Because that can help. Because that makes a difference. I mean, Indian do so many films now every year. I mean, they cannot all go to festivals and make money and, you know, but let's say find the 10 great Indian films every year, or 20 maybe, that can have a life on the international festival circus. That's my mission for today. Nicole, would you like to add what your journey has been like and where it's going? Yeah, I, I would also say that, um, of course, it sounds lovely how Penn is um, financing his films, but it's not at all our reality. So um, I'm a big fan of co-production. I think it's an adventure. So most of the time I'm not doing my films for money. This, I mean, I do them for a reason because I believe in the stories and filmmakers, as you do, of course, too. But maybe... Um, our story is a bit smaller and they're maybe diverse, cultur culturally diverse, very often also like first-time filmmakers, so it's um, not at all the kind of films that um, we can usually get financed by investors or streamers. We all have the hope, but we see that most of the time they are doing and more and more like very commercial films at a low risk for them and um, of course it takes a long time but it's also a beautiful adventure. Um, I understand directors who um, say I want to do it quicker 
Um, for producers, I think it's very often not so attractive because we're giving away all the rights and all our hope also, because we know that maybe five or ten of our films are not doing commercially very, very well, but um, there might always be the one that it does. And of course, festivals, I mean, this is the reason why we're here. And I think it's a beautiful adventure to, um, to go for that kind of co-producing, even if it gets more and more complex and complicated. It's still a very hardful thing. Thank you so much. That's great, Nicole. Now, we've heard Pan on the fast track. We, uh, so, yeah, for every film, for every filmmaker, there are different tracks based on the project. Based fast yeah, track be because he's a known filmmaker. Yes. Because his previous features were like Samsara, went to a major international film festival. For example, talking about France, got major theatrical release. And he has a name to himself. And young directors, you need to learn to sell yourself, to make a name for yourself. To, to make a character out of yourself and to, to attend festival and to attend co-production platform and to... A country cinematography is represented by its famous directors. And when uh, I'm a buyer, it's this weirdest, strangest breed in this industry. We know better than everyone. <laughs> we buy, we set the trend. And among buyers, it's about whom you know as a director. And um, I'll, I'll tell my story afterwards. <laughs> No, I think this is great, where no, you're no. bringing Just it. Just to give you an example of my preconceived ideas, or most of the buyers' preconceived ideas, like, what, what was it, 10 years ago? Cinemart, co-production market in Rotterdam. And I, book a, enfin, I received a booklet, and there are so many projects, you can't meet all of them. There's an Indian project. First half, enfin, director I've never heard of him, I think it was his first feature, and it's Indian. I'm like, Indian cinema? Yeah, it's Bollywood, it's not for me. I'm an art house, independent French, I'm looking for can title, blah, blah, blah. I don't attend the meeting. No French go to the meeting. Not a single French company, no, actually, no, wrong, wrong. Not a single French sales company, a French producer goes to the meeting. It turns out the project was Ritesh Batra's The Lunchbox. Uh -huh. Then the movie gets selected into Cannes Critics Week. There's a screening in Paris. All the French distributors go there. And you know there are the hierarchy in distributors all the biggest, and we were like among the biggest independent. We all pass, we see the film, we see the finished film, and we have such preconceived ideas about our audience, that we're like, oh no, it's nice, yes, let's go. We, we went to have Indian food in an Indian restaurant after the screening, because we were craving for food. The movie made you wet our appetite, yeah. and we forgot the basic rule. If a mo movie makes you hungry, it's a movie that will work. And we passed, it was picked up by a small distributor, it did gangbuster business in France, like close to 500,000 admissions. I can't remember the US box office, but it was insane. Just to say, we thrive on our preconceived ideas based on our history, our culture. So it's of the utmost importance for, to have government support like Unifrance. Unifrance is promoting, as you were saying, French films the world over. It's very important. The representation, as you were saying, in festivals is of the utmost importance. The year when there was lunchbox afterwards, you had Gangs of Vassepour in, in Directors for Night, it became like, wow, you can see what we call, I'll be harsh, a real Indian film, meaning not a Bollywood film, from us, Westerners' perspective. And it opened gates, and for sales agents, I'm not surprised Orange Studio, which is a big mainstream company, goes onto your film. Famous director, with a small budget, and it's, there is an, what we call the, I'm sorry for my harsh word, exotic market. There is an audience for exotic titles. So it's all about representation, attending festivals, make, and for directors, like, but you're, you already did the job, but making yourself known, getting to, getting to know how to talk to, to critics, get, getting to know how to talk to industry people. And then we'll talk about No, no, this is absolutely, you know, uh, astounding. And you're right, like, Lunchbox was paving the way, but like now if you see in the last five years or seven years, we've had, you know, a film at least every year with, you know, Masan and Uran and Titli and Agra from Kanubahel this year. So I think there is content coming and I hope that it has helped to change that preconceived notion over time, but it takes time and it takes good content and it takes repetitive sort of, you know, 
uh, confirmation that there is content out there. But when you're starting out, and I'd like to welcome Mr. Sharma, who's joining us on the panel. Uh, you know, I want to come to you, Ms. Cave, because we're talking about how to position, how to bring together a project. And from Indonesia, you not only work with the government, uh, and congratulations on the announcement yesterday. Uh, they have uh, announced last night the fund, and I'll let you tell us more about it. But also on your productions that you have worked with, government funding as well as private funding. I want to see if between, that's why I guess you're sitting in the middle between the two ends of <laughs> this co-funding spectrum of how it comes together. I'd love to know what your experience has been and if you have any learnings to share with us about how you do things. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like uh, last night was really amazing for us. I mean, not only the Indonesian filmmakers, I think like for you know all of us as filmmakers that um, the government, the Ministry of Education, uh, Culture, Research and Technology, they just launched like this match fund. So it's a match fund that uh, if we receive uh, X amount of fund from everywhere around the world, I mean, they will match it, uh, how do you say, like one? One is to one. Yeah, one is to one, yeah. So, I mean, uh, Indonesia, uh, we don't have like a public fund for since forever, so we never have that idea. I think the economic system is pretty much the American style. So it's very uh, investment, um, heavy on investment. So like to do a co-production, actually like um, when I started, I really have to learn from, you know, from, yeah, from like festivals. Um, I remember I started with Rotterdam. Uh, I think that was around 2005. Then I got then I got to see you know if you want to be a producer like and making like this type of movie, that's the struggle. That's the struggle. I mean, uh, I can imagine like I can like you know like doing co-production can be like really uh, a headache, uh, and the waiting game. Um, yeah, it's it's it's. It needs another endurance for the filmmakers and directors. Mostly, they are not able to do that. <laughs> I would say, like, they really want a quick uh, shooting the, the the film. But yeah, going back to the co-production. So, I think like the ministry uh, this year uh, decided to do this uh, because they've seen that Indonesian films we only have like probably less than three even every year in the. In the in the festival, probably only only one, two, sometimes short, sometimes feature. So in a way, then um, it's a way also to improve, like like improve our, not improve, but like if we like this type of the world, like this type of film, like why we are in the festivals. I would say that this is the way. To, to do it with the co-production. Of course, I, I can imagine with the equity, Indonesia is very much into that. And, as, and, and recently, I did produce a Vengeance of Mine, All Other Pay Cash. And then at the end, we really managed to um, balance both. I did 50% uh, on the private uh, investment and then another 50% on the grant. So I think from the producer's perspective, I think that's the way what I learned at this moment. Yeah, I started with very much independent. I'm very uh, heavily uh, dependent on the, all the European funding. But then when I started, like I think like around 2016, when I, I feel like, um, no, I have to try working with the private. Probably like the initial ideas because of the, this patience thing uh, that you have to. But as a producer, I really have to kind of like learn with, with all financing style that you have. So, and it feels great. You know, if, if we have like a 50-50 of private and, and grant, you know. So we kind of like, you know, we want to go there, but we also can minimize the risk. So I think um, uh, it, there, there is a way. I mean, it needs also creativity then in the financing uh, for the co-production. Um, Thank you. And Anubam, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know uh, you're based in Sydney and you've raised financing for some of your last projects. Do you want to tell us a little bit if there's a particular pathway for the kind of projects that you're doing? Uh, is there a different sort of roadmap for different kind of projects or 
Is it like the same people that you know that will come and back you irrespective of whether it's a doc or a feature? Like what has that process been for you? So coming from Australia, we're very spoiled because um, our worst case scenario is 40% of the total budget from the government uncapped. Um, and that's not equity based. That's called producer's offset. On top of that, you pile up. Um, we, <laughs> You, we have a co-production treaty with France here. Yeah. You pile up um, state benefits, you pile up reinvestment. So our pitch, so I started the Australia India Film Fund about five years ago. Our first feature was Brett Lee and Tanishta Chatterjee's An Indian. So we essentially, uh, investment from India, which has skyrocketed in the last two or three years, including investment from, from Indians around the world, is pretty simple. We give them uh, not a formula in terms of story, but we give them a formula in terms of telling them that no one can guarantee your investment in a film. What we can do in Australia is reduce your risk by 60% um, because that's guaranteed money back. So that has resulted in more and more people investing and getting the returns back. Um, but with the co-production treaty now happening between Australia and India, as the minister mentioned yesterday, this has increased. And... Uh, complemented by the fact that Australia has got more India centric Currently, we've got about $70 million worth of India-centric stories. They range from a bandit like Beckham in Australia to a Kalhonaho in Australia, totally Hindi language film. And these are just analogies I'm giving. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, and, and people, there are people who back us all the time. They're, you know, from India, uh, astute investors are looking very, very closely. I mean, Vivek Rangachari, who was one of the producers of Lunchbox, has invested in two films because not only do you get equity-based money, um, the procedures are very simple, the accountancy is very transparent, and the help is there at every level, regional, state, and national level. I mean, my current film, which we are releasing a um, first look on Monday, is a high-budgeted documentary and 65% of the money has come in from non-equity based thing. It's called Brand Bollywood, um, and it looks, it's a Western perspective where everyone talks about Bollywood, but no one knows about it. And again, we combine these two things. We have huge stars from India, from Anupam K to Farhan Akhtar to Samir Nair to Sajid Nair. They have all spoken on the camera for the first time. And we combine that with the grants we got. Um, and I mean, I know it sounds very dramatic, and. and but literally the funding is closed within weeks, if not a couple of months, with these two things. Um, because Sitting in the right spot. I mean, You're no, I mean, and, and that's serious. And, and, and it has been proven in the past, you know, um, classic example, an Indian, which was a Brett Lee story, um, which is currently showing on Stan and Hotstar in India. It was a $5.2 million film. The investors had 3.9 million in their pocket before we started shooting. So after that, the film has to be really bad, and the director has to be yeah. really bad to not make money. So, you have something to I mean, we just decided we are going to move to Australia. <laughs> no, we don't want more competition. <laughs> no, we are very happy. We'll deal with you. <laughs> I mean, Australia seems a place for Indian. I mean, Nashan is also ra running your festival in Sydney. So, I mean, it's a good place. Yeah, Nashain is learning. You know, Anurag is coming there next, yeah, yeah, I think, sure. two weeks from now. But uh, this is all available on the website. All you have to do is just go on Screen Australia website. And just, it's just a little comment to, to spoil the nice uh, moment. I mean, I remember years ago when I was reading the return of investment of all money uh, invested by UK funds in one year. And uh, I, I know a lot of UK producers, and they're always explaining how stupid we are in, in Europe. So at that year, it was 2% 2 2 of the money invested came back. So you are apparently the only country on earth where like investors are getting, I mean, really full heart and happy. And no, everything. no, no. I have to, as I said, it's, the, it's not the investors getting the money back yeah. because some of the films are still under productions. It's investing with a guaranteed reduced risk. Yeah, yeah, sure. No one can get any fund who comes to you and says, oh, we'll guarantee your money back. They're lying. But what they can do is guarantee the reduction of your risk, and that's a very important discipline. You know, I just don't want to say false things out there. So, Thomas, we'd love to know. We've, you've seen now, and, and you've been at the helm of meeting people who come to you at a script stage looking for co-productions, and you also see finished films when you're looking at distribution. 
what is there a pattern? Is there something that you look for? What is it once you're beyond that preconceived notion? Like in a project, why and when do you, you know, become involved? Okay, um, it's going to be very personal. It's going to be very French oriented because basically French are snobbish and we know better about cinema because we invented cinema. And because can no, we... No, no, ah, no way. History is made by the winners. We, did, we won. Uh, I love Cannes. <laughs> and Cannes remains by far the biggest, best festival and market uh, all year long. And it's the biggest festival because it is the biggest market. And both are utterly linked. Because what's interesting about cinema is it's an art form, but it's an industry, and it's a mixture of both, which makes it so intrigues, in, um, increasingly, at the same time, difficult, but fascinating. Because uh, cinema, by its very essence, is the most collaborative art form, hence collaboration in co-productions, but where in between directors and producers, it should be a couple with your sales agents. I know it's an ideal world, but it should be a family. And as a sales agent, as a distributor, looking at projects, it's about either it comes to you through a co-producer, French co-producer. Uh, I might say harsh things about French co-producers. I'm, I'm allowed. Uh, no, because France is a big territory in terms of art arts market. And we have great, sub, uh, great government uh, system with CNC, with Edo Cinema du Monde, Advance and Recipe, blah, 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 blah. And you have the beware of the mirage of the so-called French co-producer, room like a shark, in, uh, rooming around all the co-production markets all year long, being invited, not spending a dime, and getting a project. And just because he's French, he's entitled to go to yeah, I'll be your co-producer. I'll go to Edo Cinema du Monde, which is which is government money. He doesn't spend a dime. He will take his salary. He will do nothing. He will do part of the post in France. Yeah, French post-production is great. And then he will be like, he will own the territory. And it can sometimes can be a very important territory in terms of business. I'm talking about money. In terms of money, French audience is the most art house audience on earth in terms of numbers. So you might want to be aware of that. And to, in today's world with potential streamers worldwide deal, you might want to be cautious about what your French co-producer has access to in terms of owning France or only part of the rights or basically when it was a French co-producer coming to us, like I said, we passed on Lunchbox. Then a French co-producer came to us with Ritesh next project, the photograph. And we're like, yeah, it's a French co-production. So for us as French distributor, it's a good thing because if it's a French co-production, we have access to French subsidies for us. So on the one hand, it's a good thing. It turned out the French co-producer didn't manage to co-produce it. They were bad at it, let's put it mildly. We still came about the film because we loved the script. We bought the, uh, the film from the sales agent, Match Factory, German sales agent, great sales agent, who was the sales agent of Lunchbox. Because we passed on Lunchbox and we were like, oh, fuck, the movie did so much money. How and we love the film. How come we passed on it? Basically, it's about, as sales agent, it's about first committing to to us at script stage, to a story which you feel like, okay, this is different. There is something to it. Um, you remember the script, you read the script in the morning at night, you keep remembering. I'm, I'm using very big stereotypes, but just to say, sales agents, uh, we're here to share our passion for a film with the widest audience possible. Yes, of course, we're only, talking, we're only thinking about the market, meaning we want uh, movies that can appeal to a world audience. And the best thing for that is uh, you know the 90 second American pitch where you reference films or you can sum up your film in one sentence? Though I hate it because I'm French and I love art house and blah, 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 blah. It's a good thing. If you're able to sum up your film in one sentence, the sales agents will use that sentence to pitch it to buyers. And buyers will listen to that because afterwards we'll use the same sentence to pitch it to exhibitors. It's, I'm talking about like Lunchbox. It's a love story with Indian food. That's a lousy pitch compared to the, the struggle to make the story. But it's, you know what? Everybody responded to it. Uh, Gangs of Asepur, the Indian godfather. Simple. It has nothing to do with the godfather. But first time we were seeing, so I was just like, gangster movie coming from India. Wow. I, and I love, I'm dying to see Kennedy. Because I'm like, wow, 
I, I can't wait for this for Anurag's new film. It's about, and then sales agents, we, we thrive on trends. And those movies, Lunchbox, Gangs Gaba Sepur, they open trends because they showed there is a market for, the, for Indian, another type of Indian movies, theatrical, on VOD, on DVD, streamers, opening a whole new market because, because of the diaspora and because streamers have enabled world audiences to have access to such a variety of films. Then if you, um, at a second stage, I can talk, uh, be, be very critical of streamers. I hate them, but I keep on working with them. It's, it's this mixture of industry and artistic side. It's about, you have to know what your movie is about. You have to be able to sum it up, and there's, to sum it up in one sentence. You have to, and you have to, you have to be convincing for us to be convinced. And then there's the economics, MGs. Why should we put up an MG? We provide our workforce and time and energy. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but it's, it's true. The idea for us is to provide the, la the smallest MG ever because we want to make money. And as Orange, we will be like last in and first out. We'll recoup first. And then eventually you'll see royalties. That's a business. But then it's, it's strike a relationship. Uh, match Factory, they picked up Lunchbox. Now, of course, they co-produced the photograph. And they didn't lose money by co-producing the photograph. They access their soft. So it's all about us, Le Pact. We, we launched it to co-productions because we wanted us also as sales. Every sales agent now is also co-producing more often than not. They don't know how to be co-producers, huh? but they want European ones. They want to have access to public funds. It's all about money. Nicole, Christoph, Miske, have you done a co-production with a sales agent yet? Or anything from that side? Or are you looking forward to? Mostly French sales agents. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying, I think, 10 minutes before, that there is this, uh, this model in the U.S. that, that big players are producing and sell, selling in the main, same time. So you have access to market, and uh, of course there's no funding as such so much in the U.S., but anyway, sure, it's, it's a current model, sure. But what I really like is that you say, put your story in a log line, you make it, and make your audience hungry. I really love it. I never heard of that before. <laughs> so that's, that's very nice. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's another tip. May I share? I mean, a very interesting model to get your project a bit further is to find one of your partners being part of the festival work. So I had the pleasure to work with uh, Marco, who was here around five min ten minutes ago. So Marco Müller, we, we were together on Tropical Melody. And of course, that is a film almost uh, 15, 18 years ago from Apichat Pong Viera Seca too, the Thai director, at the beginning, more or less, and that helped enormously. So that's another, let's say, sharing. It's for free. So that opened doors. That was oh, an yes. interesting strategic oh, yes. alliance. No, and... If you're asking if you want to co-produce with um, sales agents, it's usually that they replace us as a producer when they do that. I mean, like Match Factory, when they produce, then they don't need a German producer anymore. You know, it's, it's all about money. It's um, being more close to the talent. Um, so we prefer to have MGs from our sales agents, of yeah. course. Uh, no, uh, until now I uh, I haven't tried to co-produce with the sales agent, uh, but I can imagine uh, what you said that uh, the producers then you know because they know the market, they have the access to, to the market. Yeah, so it feels like uh, you know like from it's like practically like from producing and also the market of uh, the market access is there. So yeah, I can imagine so. You have to be, you have to be, you know, you, you need, really need to know how to then produce, like, for that kind of, like, you know. And my next question is for you, because a lot of people here are filmmakers, they have projects, they're probably hearing everyone and learning. But I think what I think you've done, 
uh, by representing not just your own style of filmmaking, but with your projects, the approach to be someone for people on the other side that uh, understand and, and align. And for you, probably it came naturally because, you know, there was a disalignment with wanting to do films in India, like a lot of us, you know, also fall to do. Uh, but as a learning, like, what did you have uh, to build as a relationship with your first co-producer who you, you know, worked with over many years, but you can deepen that with every time you trust somebody and then you go back and you work together. But for new filmmakers, how do you establish that connection? How do you choose the kind of cinema you want to do and whether it's right for a co-production or not, or whether it's more friendly for a sales conversation because there is a box office potential that will excite a different kind of a co-production. That is something that you had very clear in your mind, which even as producers, sometimes you know we all don't know if it's the right alliance, it's the right partnership. And coming as a filmmaker who I think you're equally, you know, a very competent producer to have cracked all of these beautiful uh, strategies, what do you have to share with us to get everyone ready and prepared? I mean, for me, uh, my own experience that I struggled a lot in India in my early days uh, with my five, six screenplays, I went to every place to raise fund, but it was always the question, who is in it? Is there a big Bollywood star? If not, they don't want to even read it. So that was one. Second option was to go to a place like NFDC. Uh, so I applied there, waited for three years to get some funding. But ultimately, that time the committee said, oh, you've never been to film school. We don't know if you can make a movie. So I didn't get money there. So I had made shorts and documentaries which had gone around and uh, I was financing my living by making documentaries for Discovery Channel and BBC. I was lucky enough to get that job. But out of all the script I had, it was really hard to get money, you know. And uh, unless and until I embraced popular Indian cinema wholeheartedly. Anything else was nearly impossible to finance. So there was a time when Mira Nair you know, who had loved my work and said, like, look, I will produce your first feature film. Why not we do it in English? So I went to New York and spent six months there <laughs> trying to do it in English. And I said, okay, but I don't want to do this story in English because it will be fake. You know, I've spent years writing it. Let's do something else if you're in English. So that didn't really work out. Then there was a screening of my movies, a short film and a documentary, and there happened to be German producer Karl Baumgartner. And he saw the, the film and later the director of Cinematic introduced me to him and he said, oh, don't you want to make feature film? I said, that's all I want to do. I'm waiting for six years. He said, give me your script, you know. So I said, yeah. I used to have seven, seven, six, seven script, always printed, hard copy in my big bag. I said, Let's here see. you go. <laughs> uh, and he took a train from, I think, Paris to his, uh, to, 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 Kirk, to Cologne, I think. And on the train he read, and next day he called me and said, I love the script, but it's impossible to make. I said, no, please give me one chance. Let, can I take the same train and come to see you? I'll fly down, but don't just say no right now. He said, no, you can't make this. This is a $10 million movie. Uh, and this Ladakh, I just Googled, it's a crazy place. They just had a war there, you know, and whatever. Uh, there's no flight and it's 15,000 meter and you want to shoot in CinemaScope, you know. And these days, last one, Trier has introduced Dogma. Let's shoot Super 16 handheld. I said, please, please, you're going too fast. <laughs> Let me come <laughs> to talk to you, you know. <laughs> so... I arrived there. These are all great experiences. He loves playing football on Sunday. So I was called to a football stadium. Uh, and he's playing a football with a, uh, for a long time, uh, Berlin festival director, you know. Uh, they're both playing football and they're talking about it. Then, you know, he takes a break and say, okay, what can we do, you know. So I said, I, this, I have the budget. I have the photographs. I know how I can make the film. It was not just the screenplay. I've done my homework and it can be done. Uh, he said, okay, let's do one thing. I'm going to send my line producer with you to Ladakh. If she says that you can do this in one million euro, you are on. I said, that's a good deal. <laughs> so next thing we did was we flew, you know, and we also flew with cinematographer, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, he... In four weeks, I had done my homework, 
and Claudia Stephen, who was a producer, who came back. Strangely enough, it's possible to do this, you know, the, the cost. So I think uh, then they started doing all the co-production applications. So, you know, they uh, worked with French co-producer. Then they got Italian. We got Indian side. So it was three country uh, co-production, the first feature. Uh, and we made the movie, you know. And uh, so then it was, everything was new to me. I had no idea what is a sales company, distribution. I was too much of cinephile and filmmaker, not knowing really anything about the financing side. I knew how to make budget, you know, ab about my movie. So when they told me, okay, we'll have a sales company and uh, uh, we should go to Venice and Cannes and, you know, and I had never been to any of these festivals. Then ultimately said, no, no, we are not going to anywhere. We're going to go to Toronto because it has a good market and we can sell the film. And so I was just following them, you know, their advice. Uh, and I said, like, why would you go not to Cannes and to Toronto? So it was a first learning for me. He said, in Toronto, you will have people who will pay $20 to watch movie. In Cannes, everybody's watching free. So, and plus, you will have real audience of multiple ethnic group who will be in the audience. So we want distributor to watch the movie while they are with some Indian, Asian, people of different origin, you know, in the public screening, not the accredited, because in certain festival, everyone has something to do with cinema. You know, so he said, for you as a first-time filmmaker, it's better we go there. We said, okay, that sounds great. And it paid off because uh, we, no one knew about the film when we arrived there. Uh, so me and my music composer, we said, like, in two days we have a screening, 1,600 seats. We went to box office, only 200 seats are sold. <laughs> so he said, like, this is crazy. So we printed postcards. Literally, we are standing in the street in Toronto and... Hey, please come and watch our movie, you know, it's a great love story set in the Himalaya, you know, and all that. Uh, with the first press screening, luckily, sometime how little things can do big thing, uh, Toronto Star carried the story that, okay, today's movie, this is what you should watch. So, uh, so by the time we went to the box office, you know, it was sold out. Uh, the newspaper story, and because of that story, Harvey Weinstein said, I want the print in my my four season suite, you know, I want to see the movie right now. And uh, so he that night at 2 a.m. he watched the movie and 8 a.m. he purchased the film and that came out in variety and then within 24 hours he changed the career of the film. You know, we sold almost 80 countries and <laughs> you know, every, <laughs> every single festival invited us. Sundance who said, okay, if you do Toronto premiere, you can't come to Sundance. They say, okay, now you can also come to Sundance. So I think sometime, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of, more recently, even with a documentary I did on Kumbhela, you know, we did around like 50,000 admission. Sophie Dulac released it, you know, in Paris. And it's a documentary. Uh, we were at Toronto, Tiff Doc. Uh, there were not any sales. But two days later, Darren Aronofsky watched it. And he put literally nine words of tweet. We had four distributors acquired the film. He just said, wow, you know, I have watched a lot of movies, but this is it. This is for, it, for me, you know. People say, hey, what's this? Why Darren? You know, there were 300,000 300, likes on the tweet. So, and we didn't even know he was going to watch the, watch the movie. You know, he had watched the trailer and told Cameron Bailey, I want to go and see this documentary because everything linked with certain spirituality interests me. So I think over the years, I have learned to understand what is the role and respect, you know, what sales agents are about, you know, and I realize it's really, as a filmmaker, I should stop talking, I should be just listening, you know, <laughs> and learn to listen from people uh, who have been in business for a long time and see whether they are interested in my stories, you know, whether they are universal enough. Some stories are so Indian, this cannot travel uh, everywhere. Uh, so I, I, I just feel that one has to be, first of all, the honesty to your story, that I as a filmmaker first fall in love with my character and story. Then I worry whether it's universal or not. And sometimes I know many of my projects will not get through, you know, because they think, oh, this is extremely Indian, we can't sell it. But in all this, I have learned another thing, which is most important, that even once you have a sales company and a distributor, the marketing has learning about marketing 
has been a great experience. Like we just came from Japan. We are on the 16th week uh, with last film show. Uh, we know that such things we should be spreading in Indian press because that will encourage a lot of filmmakers. Sometimes to have a right distributor. The amount of work Sochiko Studio did, uh, you know, to release with 15 uh, print, you know, and then they expanded to 25. And 16th week now, they are in 40 theater. Uh, so, uh, but the marketing is just, was a masterclass. I had gone there for three days, me and producer, we decided to stay whole of January. We went with them to every, it's like, how do you do this? Last film show, those who might have seen it, cello show, you know, it's about, some call it Indian cinema, paradiso, whatever it is, but it's inspired loosely from my childhood. And it's a kid discovering cinema and falling in love with Indian countryside. Uh, it's also about food. <laughs> uh, it's about food, films and friends, you know, very simple theme. But they showed it to Nikki and Stock Exchange. I said like, what, why, uh, you know, so my all interviews are with financial magazine. Nikki Asia, Stock Exchange Tokyo, you know, and they are asking us questions. And they said, no, this is the best movie about entrepreneurship. So I had to go back and literally watch my movie and fast forward. How is this movie about entrepreneurship, you know? Uh, then they, they did the fashion magazine, you know, because of the bangles and cinema and directors and women. And so then we did the fashion. Then they got each show a stand-up comic because I don't have any star in the movie. There are not popular Indian star. So they can't get Japanese film stars. So they requested stand-up comic that can you come and watch this film? You're going to love it. And the, those who loved, they were asked to host one show and the press was there. So that became a national news that saw such and such stand-up comic. And then every cinema hall, you can see all this on Instagram. It's just mind-blowing. Then they made a recipe book of last film show cookbook in Japanese. And every cinema hall has four to five restaurants. When you watch the film, you can go there and eat the meal which you see in the film. So they had Gujarati item like dal dhokli. Japanese chef is cooking dal dhokli, you know. Uh, and the spread, you know, I'm going back there again because now they are going to small villages. You know, they said we are done with Kyoto, Tokyo. Now we are going to penetrate further. 16th week, and they said we want to run another couple of months. That's unbelievable for, a, for a me. And I've never seen this, anything like that in my life. Such dedication, just four women team running the marketing, you know, and uh, it was absolutely a revelation to me that how important it is because we did release the same film in Germany, you know, and the distributor said, sorry, we can't fly you down, we don't have budget. So I said, so, <laughs> so, so that's, that's, you know, in Spain, it was pretty good because we did go there. Uh, so we had, uh, because we were there, we got national news. So, uh, we had won the Seminchi. So because we went there, there was a more media coverage. And because there was a more media coverage, the TV bought it. And once the TV bought it, Amazon Prime bought the Spanish right. So we, I have seen how your thing, when we go with cast and crew, you know, how you, your presence in media increases. You know, rather than just putting out the film, you know, and say, okay, one more poster and... Yeah. So I, I feel that all that will go to play when we do co-production or when I go to raise money for next film. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing this amazing inspirational journey right from your first film till the most recent one. I want to uh, just come to the closure of the panel and I want to request all of you to give us one tip. I know you've already given some, you've given some, but like as a parting thought, uh, anything that you feel, you know, that we haven't covered that you'd like people to know uh, would be really lovely. As I said in the beginning, co-production is about people and of course about love and about loving characters and stories. But for me, again, the most crucial thing is talk more between yourself. I think it's important to be extremely um, truthful to oneself and also, I mean, it starts as a filmmaker and also if you're a young uh, director because you kept on asking that, I think it's really, I mean, it has to come out of your heart and um, you have to be aware of your expectations. I think th this is important. I mean, being truthful, authentic, um, sincere 
and all that with a lot of humor and generosity. Mm. Wow. <laughs> what can I say? I think. <clears throat> I think. Um, yeah, making film is 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 like taking so much time, a lot of effort. But at the same time, for me, you get uh, a new family. Um, because the intensity of like the communication and the work and everything is so intense, and I think when you wanna go there, think about that. I wanna that we wanna see this film another five to ten years. It's not just something that you wanna release just for one year and then that's it. But I always think that I will have to love this film that I made in another. 20 years even. Uh, basically, we all went through two years of pandemia, and pandemia taught us one thing. We can't survive without stories. We survive by reading, by watching films, by listening to music. So there's never been that many ways of showing, broadcasting, sharing a film. There's been technological evolutions the world over, yet it remains all about what you're going to say, what's the story. Be daring, be brave, be adventurous. If there's one rule in cinema, is that there are no rules. And go watch movies. What you're attending can you can't leave Cannes without having seen one film. You you nurture, you nurture your own art, your own cinematography by watching others. It's such a young art form. Everything has to be. Every story has been said, yes, but it's all about saying it in a different way. Be brave. Okay. Anyway, I mean, I of course totally agree with you, and uh, we all, of course used to say there are three cliche. You need three things: story, story, story. But my new understanding is that we need five S. You need story. You need star. You need studio. You need streamer. And now you also need a great sales agent. <laughs> sales can come before the streamer. <laughs> So agreeing with what everyone has said, uh, rather than S, I would go to P. If you have got purity, passion, and perseverance, like Pan has shown many times, for your picture project, it will happen. But always remember, money is usually your first worry, but it ends up being your last problem. You have so many other problems. <laughs>